section of the Bengal Timbers Business IT Enclave, building nation with technology, focusing on economy and social capital. We have our visionary speaker, Dr. Sanjay Baru, writer, policy analyst, and economist, and industry lead speaker, Mr. Chandrasekhar Khosh, managing director and CEO, Bandhan Bank Limited, and past president of the Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Mr. C. N. Raghupati, senior advisor, Infosys Limited, its moderating the session. I would request Mr. Raghupati to please take the session forward. So, so thank you, Mr. Ghosh, and thank you, Mr. Baru. It's indeed a pleasure and a humbling to be among the company and walking among the company of giants. Uh, with the respect, with due respects to you, Mr. Baru, I'll uh, pose the first question to Mr. Ghosh. And uh, Mr. Ghosh, uh, you know, uh, sometimes a person defines a city. And uh, when you say Calcutta, you say banking, the name comes out as Mr. Bush. Okay. You are a legend in your lifetime. You have very aptly for Calcutta as a city, which is very humane and uh, uh, looks at human values. You sort of made your mark in opening the first uh, bank, I would say, for the poor, if I may, uh, which touched the life of millions. So I'll first, uh, you know, request you to talk for about a few minutes about your journey, what gave you the thought of financial inclusion as a human development indicator. How did you, you know, even think in those days of using technology as a lever, you know, much ahead of your times? What has been your journey? And uh, if you can just start on that note, uh, you can take three to five minutes or whatever time you feel like. And what are your failures and what were your watch out points before you succeeded? Because it's very rare that a person succeeds the first time. So over to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Raghupati, sir. Uh, this is my the great pleasure I am attending uh, in this the interaction session. And uh, whatever you mentioned about it, Yes, I get a lot of opportunities uh, because of Calcutta City. And uh, it's a main motive of the bank <clears throat> is from my side and also from the regulator side, giving the license to us is a financial inclusion. And uh, <clears throat> even, sorry, even if I see that the, how we can be like to keep the access of financial services to the people who are bottom of the pyramid. This is the main objective of the bank. And accordingly, we are uh, spread the network such a way, every corner of the country. And which is now say that the 71% of the uh, banking outlet in the rural and semi-urban. But if I come to this Indian banking industry, where that the 70% people living in rural, but the only 11% bank branch in the rural, that Bandhan Bank had the 39% bank branch in the rural. So it is means on that showing the interest of the bank, how we can be reached to the more people, those are under bank or unbanked till now in India. Uh, this is in one side, we see that the very important for our country, if we like to see that the 5 trillion economy, we like to give the more focus on that, those people who can be get the financial service from formal entity, not from the private money lenders on that. My second point on that, what's happening on that? Uh, if I give to the, this, the one and four years before, and I started the beginning, uh, a bank had been opened that six years before, after the two years, I visited the Bordaman city and of my branch. After coming out from my branch, I went to this, the petrol pump. And I have been taking the fuel from the petrol pump and offered the card. And he's looking in my face and asking me card 
who will accept bardhaman city if you know about bardhaman city they refused to my card even atm card they refused and i called by phone to my manager and i have been asked to withdraw some money he is in uh, standing in there uh, as a security with my car because i cannot carry my car i go to the branch and withdraw my cash from the atm and pay to them this is was the this was the scenario in in our calcutta no i say that in india and if if you say that the couple of uh, weeks before i am going to shanti niketan without any money i have been got the fuel by car i have been uh, travel with the first take with the toll and every toll there is a no queue i went to this that the uh, shukti god for lancha purchase i also paid by upi i go to the shanti niketan and also i have been given that product up. i have been buy from the small shop is in is in uh, handicrafts and i also paying with that the qr code based of the transaction and i feel that now it is a very good opportunities have been built up this the uh, digital technology which is called we, we say that the, the change the people's behavior from the four years before to today if i say that when i returning back again i have been stand on that the uh, shakti god and uh, again i have been carry for some of the lancha and i saw that couple of people are selling the jhalmuri and i am asking that the where you take in the loan they are my customer and i am asking that the how you are paying now installment because of corona issue he mentioned about it i am paying everything now upi to the my installment so i say that the what change has come the because of these people are educated about the digital transaction about the formal banking services and they are getting that the formal services from the banking industry that have been helped them to come to this position so that i feel that if we like to make a financial inclusion in more we have need to physical and also the digital both side should be drive because uh, you, you you know that the when i open the bank i have been open the one day 501 branches and every people is a surprise asking on that the digital market now you are coming as a physical infrastructure physical infrastructure has given me the people as a new bank to this to the people more is a closely as a physical touch to convince them educate them about the formal financial services and also digital services which is now coming to this position which i saw that now as a bank 88% of total transaction happened in digital and we are targeted on that it will be very soon it will be reached to 95% transaction of out of total transaction will be happened digitally so this is the things i feel that has been contributed to the financial inclusion of our country it is not the end in here future we like to more focus on that uh, uh, way how we can be reached to people on that thank you thank you sir that was very illuminating uh, in fact uh, if you look at uh, all the taxation the digital architecture of the country itself is changing because if you look at the if you look at the platforms the government platforms have all become digital the banking platforms have all become digital with aadhar like you rightly mentioned upi it has become digital and of course you have the commerce platforms which are already digital so i would say that uh, would you say sir that about 70 to 75% of the transactions in the country today are digital mr ghosh no if i say that the as per the last uh, one of the study report has come and which is prepared by the accenture i hope that that is in 60 crores the people have the uh, uh, smartphone and 50% of this phone are used the digital transaction 
so if in that sense we can that the say that the uh, yes uh, 30 crores the uh, transaction happened in that not not the 70% but future what are the way are moving the country it will be uh, good because uh, because of this uh, the corona situation also is a advantage more so from last year to this year my bank and the digital transaction have been increased 116% Uh, that have been see, showing the focus on that. Seventy uh, percent of the transaction is not very far for India. That's that's a very good uh, that's a very good guesstimate of the number, sir. And uh, in fact, uh, I remember when we started the income tax project in two thousand nine, we estimated about eighty thousand people will sort of uh, uh, eighty thousand taxpayers will. Uh, actually filed digitally so there were two rates that we had negotiated with the government to file to process manual filing and to process digital filing and last three years it has all been digital filing and all six crore taxpayers process it digitally and gst is anyway digital so direct indirect taxes everything is digital mr balu sir uh, so uh, you know taking off from where mr gosh left you know he talked about the increase in digital transaction the link between the digital and the physical world that was a very interesting uh, sort of uh, two points he made where the digital and the physical world will continue to coexist similarly i know mr baru that you have been apart from you know the books you have written and the interest you have generated you have also been a very great uh, proponent of the human development uh, index or human development indicator so could you speak to us a little bit as to how do you think uh, the gdp and the hdi are interlinked with each other how do you think are we you know sort of mismeasuring our progress or are we measuring it in the right fashion how do you think we should sort of make sure both of them go hand in hand what do you think are the sub components of the hdi and uh, you know you having been close to policy being a part of the policy making how do you see all this coming together mr bal well <clears throat> first of all thank you very much for uh, having me on this panel i'd like to thank the bengal chamber of commerce i remember before covid uh, i had the pleasure of uh, traveling to calcutta to speak at a bengal chamber uh, event and so i'm delighted to be back here and at another bengal chamber event it just occurred to me uh, looking at our panel today that um, you mr raghupati are from infosys and um, the chairman of bandhan bank has been talking about the benefits of digital i remember when i used to be the editor of economic times in the mid 1990s uh, we are we were doing a story about how infosys refused to go to calcutta because uh, of the restrictions imposed on 24 hour work schedule uh because infosys said that you know our work starts in the night because our client clients are all in the us yeah. and therefore we need a 24 hour schedule uh and the bengal government and the trade unions there said that that's not possible that you know work the trade unions will not allow 24 hour work schedule we have traveled a long distance from there um and that today not only does calcutta have a very vibrant uh, it district but uh, we now have a bank like bandhan bank which talks about the merits of digital so you know i i thought i should make a reference to the distance we have traveled but my biggest concern when we talk about technology and since today we are talking about technology uh, is that we have had a lot of success in application of technology i mean finance digital banking etc is a good example of the application of technology but almost all of the technology that we develop or that we use uh, in wide range of sectors uh, are, is borrowed technology imported technology how much technology are we developing at home what has been our record in patenting new technologies what what is the amount of royalty payment we are making out on imported technology so to simply say that oh india is becoming more technology intensive getting more digitalized you know etc etc is not enough we need to ask the question 
you know, what are we doing to develop domestic technological capabilities? Yesterday, we celebrated the Engineers' Day, which is the birth anniversary of Moksha Gundam Vishweshwaraya, the first engineer to get a Bharat Ratna. And there were a lot of jokes going around on the Twitter, and one of them said that, you know, all our engineers are doing so well in finance, in marketing, in management, you know, in, in the IAS today. You know, what are our engineers doing in all these areas? Finance, management, marketing, IAS, IPS. We have engineers all over, but not doing engineering. And I think the problem for us has been a mismatch between higher education, where we have created a lot of talent, but not adequate uh, you know, investment in the base, as a result of which uh, we are one of the most ill-trained economies in Asia. If you take Asia as a whole, um, excluding just three or four countries, large majority of Asian economies. Technologically, you see Korea where it is today. Koreans were coming to India to be trained. I know that for a fact. In the 1950s, India was offering fellowships for Koreans to come and study here and get trained here. And, and today we are using Korean technology in a range of areas. So when you talk about Human Development Index and the G GDP, GNP, the fundamental difference between the two is the HDI captures the investment we are making in social capital, in creating human capital. Because technology is nothing but the people who are involved in the translation of ideas into material objects, right? So the, the essence of technology is human capital. And unless you have investment in human capital, to simply look at technology as a material good uh, is, is uh, superficial because then you can import technology. You have a lot of countries, you take the Middle East, the Gulf countries, they export oil, they import technology. They have the most sophisticated technologically developed you know, financial sector, banking sector, educational sector, highly digitized economies. All the technology is imported. And they sell oil and buy all this technology. So, so uh, without adequate investment in human capital, I believe that you know, we are chasing uh, the, the wrong uh, game. We talk about in India being a $5 trillion economy, etc. That's not going to happen anytime soon. I think now the latest estimates I've seen, even estimates done by economists uh, who are associated with the government in Delhi, suggest that we are unlikely to be $5 trillion even in year 2030. Uh, if we are lucky, we might get to $5 trillion in 2030. But certainly 2024, which is the goal set by Prime Minister Modi, we are not going to be a $5 trillion economy. And one of the major gaps, and this is an argument put forward by none other than Dr. Surjit Balla, who is a very important economic advisor to the current government in Delhi, and who is now India's representative at the International Monetary Fund, appointed by Prime Minister Modi. Dr. Balla has written a book on the importance of education. What distinguishes India from East Asia, from Taiwan, from Singapore, from Hong Kong, from Korea, from Japan, and from China? all more developed economies than us. The single most important variable is investment in education. And in the Human Development Index, there are three variables. Uh, I forget now the exact weights given to these three variables, but the three variables in the Human Development Index are health, education, and income. Income, we have various estimates of GDP, uh, GNP, but on health and education, we fare very poorly. And unless we invest adequately, and the whole focus on health is thanks to COVID, there's a sudden realization about the importance of health. Otherwise, till then, we, you know, nobody wanted that job. I remember in the 1990s and 2000s, ministers used to crib if they were given health portfolio. If you read the autobiography of um, you know Fotedar, who was Indira Gandhi's right-hand man, in his autobiography, he complains that, oh, Narsimharov became prime minister thanks to me. I helped him, but the fellow gave me health and family welfare as a portfolio. You know? and that was the attitude of politicians. If, you get, if you're given health as a portfolio, that means you have been you know, put in the dustbin. Right? But thanks to COVID, we are focusing on health. Education, 
the new education policy has just been announced. But successive governments over the last 60, 70 years have neglected education. State government after state government. And the problem today in India, sir, is very simple. We have a highly skewed educational structure. You have some very good schools and very good institutions that are producing very bright kids. Most of them are going abroad. Most recently, I published a book called India's Power Elite, in which I have an entire chapter on what I call the secession of the successful, where I presented data to show the growing out-migration of talent from India. The numbers are staggering. In the five years from 2009 to 2014, on an annual basis, students paid average of $1 billion as tuition fees to go abroad, tuition plus residence fees from their pockets. Families paid out $1 billion per year in those five years. In the five years, 2014 to 2019, that has, figure has gone up to $10 billion, Reserve Bank data. We, and if you have seen news reports recently, how every airline was giving preference to students going out, every embassy was giving visas to students applying for admission out. You know, tourist travel was discouraged, business travel was discouraged, but students wanting to get out of India, they got their visas, they got the chairs, seats in the planes, and the flights were all taken out. Because teaching institutions in the US, in UK, in Dubai, in Singapore, in Australia, in all the countries where English language is used, in, and of course in many other countries where English is not, are dependent increasingly on Indians going out of India and studying there and many of them settling down there. So all this talk of technology, digitization, modernization of the Indian economy, sorry to you know, put a wet bank blanket on this argument, uh, does not capture the overall totality of the challenge. The challenge today for us is not just to invest in education, but to ensure that those whom we have invested in remain in India. If you see the numbers, the out-migration is staggering just in the last 10 years. Then there was a trickle from the IITs mainly going out in the 90s, 80s, 90s. But after 2000, there's a sharp increase in the out-migration of talent. And in my judgment, this is a challenge that nobody speaks about. The entire middle class is complicit because all our family members are either living abroad or children are going abroad or wanting to go abroad. We are culpable, so we don't like to talk about it. But this is, in my judgment, a major challenge for development of indigenous technology. Only two or three sectors we are able to isolate from this, uh, which are critical strategic sectors like space, like nuclear uh, you know, development, energy, and nuclear capability. You know, there are two or three sectors where we have been able to retain talent, mainly out of the commitment of the individuals involved. But in most other sectors, you know, you look at the patents, more than 60% of patents in the name of Indians are of Indians living outside India. The government tells you that there's a sharp increase in patents filed by Indians, but most of it is by Indians living outside India. So these challenges are significant and one cannot you know, simply uh, ignore them without, without paying a big price. But let me stop there. So, sorry, I've gone on longer than five minutes, which you gave me. No, thank you, Mr. Baru. The, the, uh, the only counterpoint of view, of course, I'm not supposed to give a counterpoint of view, is that if you look at the health indicators, uh, the South seems to be doing fairly well with Kerala. Kerala at a total fertility rate of 1.2 and Tamil Nadu at 1.4 and uh, uh, Karnataka, which is the poorest among the southern states as far as uh, HDI is concerned at 1.8 and uh, Andhra at 1.9. And uh, your father, when he was in service in Andhra, started, I think, the self-help group movement or he was a part of the advisory group over there. And the self-help group movement has grown to be one of the biggest self-help group movements. And if you look at the demographics, uh, the uh, infant mortality ratio down south, uh, south of the Vindhyas is, uh, of course, Kerala is an outlier at nine, but the rest of them are somewhere between 10 and 15. Whereas at the same breath, you do have the Uttar Pradeshs and Bihar at 50s and 60s. I guess what you're trying to point out is we all need to possibly look at Kerala as an example. Uh, you know, the uh, I, I get back to Mr. Ghosh and uh, 
uh, just to take on what Mr. Baru said. Uh, Mr. Baru was talking about a lot of uh, the entire need for matching the GDP and matching HDI, et cetera, and matching the indigenous technology. And sir, you are one of the few people and uh, who have indigenously stayed back in India, used technology to you know, sort of uh, set up the bank. You have used Indian technology, you have used Indian people. So what in your mind, Mr. Ghosh, is, uh, could have been better from what Mr. Baru said in terms of availability of technology in India. Of course, you must have traveled abroad, you must have seen people abroad, you must have looked at other banks. What is it that you as an entrepreneur trying to bring financial inclusion would have wanted better? And what, what would you think would have helped you along the journey a lot better? I'm talking purely in terms of technology. I'm not getting into policy making and uh, things like that. Mr. Ghosh? Oh. You're on mute, sir. Oh, fine. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Rakupoti and uh, Mr. Baru. And what I find out on that, the need to people educate about financial literacy. It is a very, uh, till now, is a, many of the people are not understand about the financial services. I hope that the now is need for the country to declare about it. Financial services from the formal financial institution is a basic need. Without the basic need of this, the formal financial services, Indian economy is very much challenging. I give the one example on that. We know that we are uh, human development index ranked in the 130 past, 31st, and uh, which is very near to <clears throat> in the country of um, Britain and France, like on that, German. But when I go to this, the the, the bottom of the pyramid, we see that the per capita income, which is, uh, we are, uh, see that the, our per capita income is near to, even below the Bangladesh, near to Namibia in that way. So in that sense, if we not increase the per capita income is more, our GDP increase it will be a challenge. So how we can be uh, increase more per capita income. We are mentioned about, we'd like to say that this model should like to change. Now new model, now model is there. The trickle down approach will be build up the industry and automatically people will get the income. So my side is say that we will be like to trickle up approach, which is the large number of people will involved in a business or enterprise where they have need in a formal financial services access is a very easy way on that. So that in the large number of people's per capita income increase, automatically our SGI will be like, will become good. So in that sense, if I like to increase the per capita income in the large number of people who are bottom of the pyramid, and we have need to first give the financial literacy first and then involve them to this, the, the credit savings and insurance. And gradually we'll educate, they will convert to the digital transaction. When they are very useful in the digital transaction, that can be helped, uh, their income also increase and their cost also decrease. I hope that the people will be come out from the poverty and financial inclusion will be successfully run of our country. This is my, my learning from the ground level. Thank you, sir. So, Mr. Baru, question to you, sir. No, this is uh, the, the 
if you if you repeat on that point the mr baru point is their health infrastructure i i understand the one point uh, yes if i like to develop in the mode uh, this uh, that the country will be like to develop will be like to focus in the rural and semi urban how we can be build up the health infrastructure and the education infrastructure why i have been given the my uh learning if i say that if i open the five branches in the rural and semi urban and no mba student are agree to go there because they have not they are not finding out because they are already practiced with the good health infrastructure and education facilities for their children but in the rural india there is not available when it is not available automatically these people are not interested so who are interested to provide this the financial service to them but they are not getting the right people on that so i hope that the government would like to focus on that how entrepreneurs can be expand their health services digitally or non digitally in the rural india then maybe the large number of people will captured and people also get the banking service and health services and education services that can be more in future because mr baru also mentioned i i like in that and i agree the because uh, from beginning of the bank i have been open my first training center to build up the skill of the people who are the people in the rural they have not any any of the skill of micro credit or financial services and very simple way we have been build up the skill and very simple person from the rural uh, from rural family and the poor family they come out to to done this job which have been helped me the ngo staff which is the very simple education and not in a first division and there is a this people has learned from us from our training center build up their skill and earn this bank license from reserve bank of india and successfully running the bank and maximum of these people are from them so no doubt it is not anything we can be like to contradict about it it's needed to focus on that skill development of the people with a different vertical and accordingly i hope that the the country will be like to benefit it give the another example uh, mr badu also maybe uh, he is a very expert on that and if you see that the the in the time of 70 and 80 and early so that time is in our gdp contributor 65% by agriculture now it has uh, reverse the 16% by agriculture 65% by service sector service sector major is an it and the banking and and insurance so in that sense the people till now 55% people are depend on agriculture who are contributed only 16% of the gdp so we are not timely and properly and uh, diversify the skill of the people go to this other sector where the demand is come more i hope that the need in the skill development is a very important for our country to develop in the rural economy and country economy thank you sir mr baru question to you so i you know you we talked about some of the ills plaguing what you call our development of our country reaching the 5 trillion dollar goal okay if not by 2024 what as a policy maker as an observer as a writer as a critic if you are like one of those popular hindi movies where i think anil kapoor is given charge of the state for a day or whatever what would be your policy recommendations or policy decisions that could sort of change this <laughs> well i think the policy options are quite obvious 
The question really is whether you have the political will to grapple them. As I said, the most important challenge we face is of a country which is under-skilled, under-educated, and where investment in uh, human capital is vastly inadequate. And if we see the experience of all the newly industrializing countries of Asia, every single one of them, in fact, forget about the more developed ones like Japan, Korea, Taiwan, take the, even the less developed ones like Malaysia, Indonesia, and Vietnam, the basic uh, distinction between India and all those countries is the inadequate investment in education, inadequate investment in research, and domestic intellectual capability. We call ourselves a knowledge superpower, a wish for guru, etc. All these words are used. But the fact is that our intellectual capability has not been fully developed. And unless we do that, we cannot be self reliant For example, you take a critical sector with which I have some familiarity. I have been involved in studying of the Indian defense industry. I used to be a member of the National Security Advisory Board. And everybody recognized for the last 20, 30 years, that we are still excessively import dependent when it comes to defense. And unless we become self-reliant in defense, you cannot really call yourself an independent country. Because tomorrow if there's a war with any country, whether it's Pakistan or China, beyond 10 days we cannot continue the war without importing equipment and arms and guns and bullets and everything, uh, including shoes and coats, as we saw in the last confrontation with China, we suddenly were running out of snowshoes. And they had to ask the Americans to give us no shoes. So we are dependent on imports in, in defense. Now, this is just one sector. I can give you several examples. So education, domestic skill development, domestic cap capacity building is the foundation of development. And, and that is what I would say has to be the most important priority for the country for a long, long time. I mean, you have to put... The, entire energy of the entire central state governments in these two, three areas of creating a much more uh, knowledge-based economy. If we do that, a lot of the other things will follow. You know, so if you ask me this question, what is the one thing that you would do if you have power? That's the one thing I would do. And by, you, know, you can blame Nehru for a lot of India's faults, but there have been several people after Nehru and now this current regime has been there for seven years. How much have we done in education? There's a national skill development mission that was launched by Dr. Manmohan Singh when I was in government in early 2000s, 2004 or 2005, the skill development programs were launched. How far have we moved on each of those programs? How many skills have we been able to create through those programs? Because the skills that we create were exporting. So we have millions of Indians, highly skilled Indians working in the Gulf for Gulf economies. We have skilled Indians working in Singapore, in Dubai. We have highly talented Indians working all over the world, in the US, in UK, in Australia, and Canada. We are not able to retain those skills. So I would say, you know, to answer your question, uh, really, that's the focus I would have. Education, skill development, you build the foundation, and then everything else will fall in place. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ghosh. One last question before I open it up to others for questions. You have used technology. Technology has moved from mainframe to entire to microservices to hosted computing. Uh, technology has moved. I, of course, obviously, you are also a guru in that. And uh, technology has now moved to a state where 5G is going to come. And the banking is also moving away from being a monolithic banking to everybody collaborating with each other. You have made a number of acquisitions. How do you see the future of technology in financial inclusion? Uh, because if you look at the digital framework of the country, taxes are now all digital. Uh, the payments are all getting to be digital. Uh, commerce is digital. So how do you see the future of financial inclusion? And uh, where do you see uh, your bank going if you want to share that with us? Where do you see technology taking it? Uh, where do you, see, do you see your bank becoming a digital bank? So just tell us a little bit into the future, your thoughts about the future, 
if you can about your bank, if not in general about what the future holds for financial inclusion. No, you are correct on that. So that we are uh, prepared our 2025 vision and focusing on that the uh, digital banking facilities one of the key uh, vision for the bank. And for that region, that the, you know that the banking have the two part. One is a liabilities part, another is an asset part. And uh, we are, the bank are investing more uh, to strengthening the digital platform. How we can be provide the services with education to the customer to use it for their liabilities, for their asset. Liabilities means already we have the opening the account by digitally. We have the video KYC to not customer need to not come to the branch to uh, open the account. And they are also from their home can be like to see their statement of the bank and transaction, everything. And other side also, we are algorithm based credit uh, scorecard are introducing to the bank to provide the credit, which the credit quality will be like to strengthen. And uh, you know that the, the already bank is utilizing the tab based banking, which is a uh, help us on that the poor people also get the access of the, their account by biometric, because these people are not the signature is correctly uh, like to make it. And the, we provided it that the biometric transaction, the, all of their transaction have been done by digitally. So this is the very big opportunities. And also we are preparing in future, which is the artificial intelligence, big data analysis, and accordingly provide the uh, customer service, whatever they have need to provide on that. And educate the customers is a, is a part of that. We are simultaneously educating the people about the financial services which is available for the banking industry. If this the part of the sum of this issue on that, you know, the uh, one of the person every day, 218 times they have been looked their mobile. So mobile phone is the part of their life. If I offer the food to my children, not the mobile, they will be not agree. They will be denied to take the food. They will accept the mobile for their life. So in that sense, how mobile can be utilized to provide all services, banking services that can be helped to strengthen our financial inclusion in our country. And uh, smartphone, you know that there is a 60 crores people used how it can be increased on that and that no 90% of adult population are used that can be also or gradually will be like to educate every month our branch people are educating their customer how they automatically pay their electricity bill telephone bill and uh, maintenance bill and they have not need the time uh, to spend on that or they can be they can be used more on that to pay the tuition fee to the children. So education is a big area. Uh, it's a need to develop on that country. Of course, there is, a, there is a challenge of infrastructure of our country. The IT infrastructure especially is, is not up to the mark. I'm not sure about it. Uh, of course, it will be developed in the day by day um, until it is not developed. Uh, and this, the transaction will be like to suffer by the people and then people will be like to negative uh, attitude for this, the digital transaction. So it's a need on that of how smoothly they can be get, get the uh, mobile connectivity, they can get the internet connectivity and how we can be spread this infrastructure to rural and semi-urban areas where people will be like to habituate on this type of transaction on that. So that is the future, future of Bandhan Bank, future of the our country people on that. We can be aligned about of this. 
Thank you, sir. Mr. Baru, turning to you. What would you be possibly writing in 2030 or 2035? Okay, so what would be your vision of the future? Uh, would you, what would you be writing? And let us assume, see, obviously you said that, you know, it requests political will. But today with all the social media, there is also a pressure on, you know, people to perform. Uh, I met one of the doyens of the industry when I was much younger in Thailand, uh, Mr. Aditya Birla, and that was a long, long back, and India had just liberalized. And he made a very pithy statement to me. You know, Raghu, it was not, uh, it was not uh, Mr. Narsim Rao who liberalized us, but it was CNN, because he said when people started seeing what, how other people live, people said, yeah, we also want that sort of a life. So obviously there is a political pressure also that people want to grow, GDP has to grow, uh, medical facilities are to grow. So taking that into account, what do you see 2030, 2035 as? What would you be writing at that time? Well, I mean, I, I hope by 2030, I don't have to go on writing. <laughs> I can <laughs> live on my, rest on my laurels. Or well, if, if I drop by, if I drop by to your house for a cup of coffee or tea, what would it be? <laughs> but you know, 2030 is not far away. I mean, we are now in 2021, nine years. Go back nine years in 20, 2012, where were we? Where we are today? It's not a long period. And my real worry is that nothing much is going to change. I think. Um, we have not understood, in my judgment, we have not understood the importance of investment in people. Uh, and and um, now we are into a phase where power is defined by political power. And the political, political power is with the majority. And the majority, as you said earlier in, in your remarks, lives in the most backward regions of the country. The most developed regions of the country are having now low, you know, declining population. The reproduction rate, as you correctly mentioned, is coming down. The, the direction we are headed is not an encouraging direction. And I used to be a great optimist on India. I've written in the past about a rising India. Today, I'm not an optimist on India. And we, we take it for granted that somehow India will be like China. But we forget that India can be like Egypt, India can be like, uh, you know, Brazil, uh, highly unequal societies, rich getting richer, poor getting poorer, lot of violence, lot of illiteracy, backwardness. Uh, it is easily possible for us to downslide. So the assumption that we had, and you know, you, since you mentioned um, what Aditya Birla said to you, the assumption from the 1980s till around the, you know, till about 10 years back, 2010, I would say, uh, was the assumption that India is on the rise. India is becoming like China. India is a developing country. Even the Chinese thought so. Deng Xiaoping said India and China are rising economies. And Asia, <laughs> it will be an Asian century because of India and China. Li Kuan Yu, who never thought much of India, who had utter contempt for India, in fact, wrote an article in the Forbes magazine in 2007 saying that India and China are like the two engines of a jet plane. And Asia is that jet plane which will rise, powered by these two engines. All that was years back, 12 years back, 2007 is not a long time back. Would anybody today say that? That India and China are like two engines of the jet engine? I mean, it would be a jet engine that will go in circles because only one engine is working and the other engine is faltering. Right? So, 2030, my concerns will not be any different from today. I will continue to worry about education. I will continue to worry about, uh, you know, the health uh, healthcare. I'll continue to worry about uh, poverty, unemployment. And I will continue to worry about the out-migration of Indian talent. Indians have been leaving India in their thousands and that will continue. And you talk about Indian companies, an increasing number of Indian companies are investing outside India. 
how much uh, you know you look at the data so it's all quite troubling so i'm sorry i'm not able to give you a very optimistic or a happy <laughs> a reply uh, at the end of the discussion i i am uh, uh, these days a bit of a pessimist and uh, i worry for our future so so with that uh, you know thank you both of you for indulging me in some of my personal curiosities let me throw it open to the rest of the audience uh, angana or uh, sankalpita can you throw it open to the rest of the audience please think you have much of an audience so you might as well conclude with this no we do have some audience i'm able to see some of them so we we have quite a bit of an audience actually this is just the uh, speakers oh, okay. uh, link so you will probably see only 5 6 uh, <laughs> of less and nothing more than that so no mr raghupati i like to uh, mention two point on that uh, the which is uh, like to mr baru have been talked about it in the 2030 uh, yes it is not very far but our uh, next generation who are coming uh, they are very faster uh, technology adapted people and that will become very fast i do not know that the my country is ready if you see that the 6 crore uh, tax payer Uh, you are faced the challenges here, but if they are started do this, the mobile technology or any other technology for projection of that, the huge and uh, how much we are ready with the server. You are technically know that, and I till now the uh, cloud base is not in the uh, uh, easily accepted by the country regulation on that. so oh, it is a very big challenge and second on that multiple card used we should be like to come now single card used we have the pen card we have the other card we have the voter card we have the driving license until we will be not coming at the single identification number for people the person so very tough to manage this type of uh, digital transformation of india and very tough to uh, manage their kyc and one person can be till now can be open their account and transact with the multiple id card with the multiple account opening and the fake we should be like to focus on that future how government can be like to look at the single id card is allowed for all this type of uh, regulatory uh, option that can be easily people can be like to safely uh, transact in future and future uh, digital will be like to very helpful for the country so one question from the audience does india have the digital infrastructure to achieve the new age goal uh, i give it to both of you you can i'm i'm not an expert on this no i, I you had already mentioned about it uh, uh, infrastructure means in the both uh, technologically and human skill both and uh, to maru uh, we have about uh, already been mentioned on that the there is a need to focus on that a human uh, capacity should be built up and uh, which is the related and it is so much changing and very quick changing and quick need to update to the people it's a very very challenging job on that and second is there the infrastructure means uh, other points i already mentioned and need to focus on that those infrastructure and uh, coordinate with the all government entities the one one single id number and uh, coordinate each other in a better way that can be future uh, digital will be helped 
full on that. Yes, infrastructure is, an, is, an, is not up to the mark of that. So Mr. Balu, one of the audience wants to take you up on your statement. So the, the person is asking, how do we address education to all and health balancing with digital access to all? Can you repeat, sir? How do you? So the question: How do you? How do you? How do we address education to all and health to all, balancing with digital access to all? Well, first I, of all, I guess he means that I. I guess he Baru means will that. be like to give the answer first, and then I can give the. Yeah. Sorry, you are saying something, Mr. Rupa. No, I think no, he, uh, what, what the person means is. Do we sort of overlay each other? How do we sort of do it? What are the policy? What is the policy recommendation? What is your thoughts on? So I'll sort of take the liberty of morphing his question a bit, uh, saying that, yeah, education for all, health for all is something that we require. So what would be your recommendations to achieve it? Especially using- Well, you see in both areas, uh, tech, digi digitalization or digital technology has helped in the sense that access has become easier. So I, you know, I know that now you're in a position to provide medical care uh, as well as education digitally, electronically, uh, and and therefore uh, you know you are able to reach a wider uh, population. But to think from that, that this is a solution for our current challenges, I think is, is wrong, for the simple reason that access uh, is still limited. You know, you take across the country. Just in the last one and a half years, then schools have been closed and uh, people have um, online classes. That has created a huge digital divide uh, within the uh, community of students. That those who have access not just to the internet and, the, and not just to you know, laptops or iPads, but to power supply and to adequate support at home for whatever is being taught online. A class divide has emerged. And I've been reading articles, including in today morning's newspaper I, or yesterday, somebody from the Ministry of Education in Delhi has written an article that this is a you know, new opportunity. Nonsense. It's a new opportunity for kids in urban areas or kids from families that can afford the technology, that that can have access to the power supply and, and, and have digital access. But to imagine that that is a solution to the inadequate investment in good schools, in good infrastructure for schools, in training good teachers for schools, is nonsense. Or to imagine that that is the solution for inadequate primary health centers, for not having enough doctors in rural areas, is nonsense. But given the existing infrastructure, uh, online access has improved you know, access to services uh, because a lot of doctors are able to treat online a lot of teachers are able to teach online so there is a, a wider reach but that is no substitute for having good public health care good primary health centers good government schools good local community schools that physical infrastructure is still needed that's what i would say yeah so uh, mr baru of course uh, mr you are noah harare i don't know whether he has a doctorate or not and we had a session, similar session with him uh, sometime towards the end of last calendar year. And he was explaining to us as a historian that what would have taken 20 years is getting compressed. So I think digital education is one of those things. It's an opportunity and a challenge. And obviously, uh, education is changing. And uh, I, uh, so I think we need to look at it from that lens. Of course, from a healthcare perspective, there is Eric Topal's famous work, uh, you know, the destruction of medicine, where he talks about the forces of genomics, the forces of artificial intelligence. But anyway, Mr. Gore, sir, there is one question to you from the audience. How mature are we in, uh, how mature are we in our financial inclusion? I guess, let me add to this question just for the sake of understanding, not to take away from the uh, audience. I guess he's saying, in a, on a global scale, Mr. Ghosh, how do you think, how mature are we in our financial inclusion? 
No, um, uh, the, we cannot be compared on that because our uh, number of population is in huge. And so that it is, in, it is not a, up to the mark of the uh, Western countries, South country, like on that. And internally, India also, the, the South India more, more uh, uh, faster and uh, we had more uh, compared to the other, other part of India. So in that sense, we cannot see that the financial inclusion, digital transaction, uh, India is not yet in the in the rank of the any of the country. Many small country also higher than us, and user basis on that. We can, we say that the we maybe many of the infrastructure have. We have the many of the people in the IT uh, uh, software developer, but not a user. User gradually is coming up, and a huge demand on that. Uh, uh, but we have need to more more education on that. We agree, and uh, because if you see that the our country's economy is also depend on more in agriculture, agriculture farmer the uh, sell their products uh, is used to buy that the app, but not that much is been started. When our farmers are getting the access to this the app. They will be avoid the uh, uh, middleman, and they will be also get the good price, and that is will be benefited to them. So who will educate them? And there is a challenge to educate them uh, within the uh, cycle or circle of the uh, uh, middleman, and they are lots of the challenge faced. If, if it isn't trying to go on that way and they are directly connected to the market to know that which market this the uh, 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 product is very demand. So in that sense, we are not that mark, but we are gradually improving such big way, which have been, I have been very hopeful future. It will become very good on that. So Mr. Baru, I think I would think that the last two questions are for you and uh, I can only imagine such questions coming out from the thinking city of Calcutta. So uh, it's quite a intellectual challenge for you, but pretty interesting questions. How does the, in how does the internet affect social capital? Do communication possibilities of the internet increase, decrease, or supplement interpersonal contact, participation, and community commitment? That's question number one. Uh, and by the time you digest the question, the last question would be, how does India get out of this deep asymmetry it has with this huge population? Whatever parameter you look at it. Well, on the first question, I mean, look, these are general questions. Everybody ha will have an opinion. So my opinion is as, as good as yours. Uh, but the fact is that, uh, you know, internet and online uh, uh, access has certainly uh, increased access to information. The question really is uh, how much and what information are we accessing? Are we using this uh, for building a more modern knowledge economy? Are we using this for the development of the country, for reducing poverty, for increasing employment, or are we using this to watch pornography or to abuse each other? I mean, that is, so it all depends on what we are using the technology for. The technology itself gives wider access. So sitting at home, you can get access to an enormous amount of information, but you can also sit at home and abuse people uh, as we do on social media or you do on, on other uh, uh, internet uh, you know, platforms or you can access pornography you know so it all depends on what we use technology for technology itself is neutral in that sense from the point of view of creating a more knowledge-based society and a society that is more modern and interesting on the second question of population so I think Mr. Raghupati has actually partly answered that question when he drew attention to the north-south differential and the fact that you know the rate of growth of population is going down is below replacement rate in Tamil Nadu, in Kerala, 
in Andhra Pradesh and Goa and many other parts of the country. Uh, in fact, India's problem um, in a few years' time could well be like China's today, where China is facing suddenly the problem of aging because of its one-child policy. It has suddenly found that there are more old people than young people. And the Chinese government is now allowing people to have a second child. Um, in, in, in our case, we have had this, uh, what was called a demographic dividend of a large uh, share of young people. But if you don't educate people, you see the difference between backwardness and development is not that the backward countries have more population and developed countries have less population. It is that the population of the developed countries is more educated. And the population of the backward countries is less educated. It's as simple as that. A human being becomes a liability if he is not adequately clothed, adequately fed, adequately educated. A human being becomes an asset if he is adequately clothed, adequately educated, and adequately properly employed. It's a basic economics. So I have never believed that population in itself is a challenge. It is what we do with people that is a challenge. And I think it was Dr. Karan Singh who very famously said at an international population conference some 30, 40 years ago when Indira Gandhi was prime minister, he said development is the best contraceptive. And the data now proves him right. Because the more developed parts of the country have now have uh, lower rates of growth of population. And, and the, uh, even in terms of social profile, the better off sections of population, upper middle class, upper class, have smaller families than the poor. For the simple reason that young women want to work. They don't want to be sitting at home and producing kids. You know, a lot of young women don't even want to get married. You know, they want, or they want to postpone marriage because they, they want to study more. They want to work more. So all these various sociological factors are contributing to a decline in the rate of growth of population. But to the extent that there are still a large number of Indians who are poor, who are uneducated, to be, go back to the point I made at the very beginning, we have to invest in their education. You have to invest in creating employment opportunities for them. That has to be the only solution. And once you educate them and employ them, they will then stop producing children because then they realize the benefits of having a small family. We'll stop with that. So to Mr. Baru's point, uh, please refer chapter seven of the economic survey. I think that was 2018, which talked about the demographic patterns and how whole of India is going to be facing replacement levels. This was quite a good chapter written under the editorship of uh, Dr. K.V. Subramaniam, who used to sit on Bandhan Bank board and is now the chief economic advisor. So, uh, you know, with that, I have to close the session for today. It has been a wonderful session. There are a few more questions, but uh, sorry, viewers, I guess you'll have to contact people directly. I will hand it back. Uh, thank you very much, both of you gentlemen. We have had different points of view, one from a person who's used to policy making and close to the seat of power, one from somebody who has built an enterprise it has been a fascinating conversation for me, at least. I've learned a lot. Thank you very much. And thank, thank you for the audience for asking wonderful questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much. I'm going to back to you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, we are concluding this session here. For Facebook, we will go re live for the next session in five minutes. For the other platforms, it will continue. Uh, thank you, Raghupati, and thank you, Dr. Badu. A very nice interaction with all of you. Thank you, Arnab and Angona. Thank you. I, thank you, Arnab. Thank you.